things that get in the way of our practice of the Dharma is clinging to opinions and views. So this is a, you know, and you say, how, what should I do? Should I do intensive practice or non-intensive practice or ordinary practice or special? I have no opinion. I mean, it's not a matter of intensity or of special or ordinary. These are qualities of of uh, condition. If you attach to intensive practice, then you think that meditation is impossible under ordinary condition. If you think that you have to meditate only under ordinary conditions, then you look down on intensive practice or avoid it. Whatever opinion you're attached to, you're bound to that opinion. And how many, look, look at there, just, uh, that's what I've been trying to <clears throat> suggest for you to do, is just look at the nature of opinion. Which is not a, a way of denying, maybe the opinions are based on good reasons and all. I'm not saying that opinions are bad. Or that you shouldn't have opinions. But to know opinions as opinions, not as uh, a self or a reality. To know that limitation of opinion frees you from being obsessed with opinions and views. That's as simple as that. Isn't it? We have some cherished opinions, admittedly that we're not ready yet to let go. <laughs> and there are a lot of opinions we'd like to throw away. There are a lot of faults and weaknesses and unpleasant habits we have that we'd like to get rid of. And there are a lot of really things we like about ourselves that we're afraid, I don't want to give out this up yet. I'm not ready to let go of that. Because you think letting go is throwing away. When I say renunciation, it strikes terror in the hearts of people. I have to give up money, give up my apartment, give up my girlfriend, my boyfriend, I have to give up my car, to give up all these things. I'm not quite ready for that kind of enlightenment. But that's another opinion in view, isn't it? Because this kind of dualistic way we think, it, it's either one or the other. You see, this, it's either black or white. It's either you, you, ha- you, you keep everything or you throw everything away. And it tends to make it this kind of simplistic uh, reasoning process that we are attached to and regard as, as, a, as me and mine. Now by letting go, I'm not saying throwing away. Because throwing away means also aversion, doesn't it? Get out of here. You throw things away you don't want. Or you're frightened of. You don't know what to do with. There's always, uh, that's an act of self, isn't it? This I don't want, I'm going to get rid of it. But letting go is, is nothing much at all. Like this, say, this fist, this tight, grasping fists. It's really grasping hold of things like that. And throwing away is like that. Get out of here. That movement. And grasping is, come here. (laughs) And (laughs) and throwing away is, get out of here. Now between those is just this. Now that doesn't look like much, does it? It's not this, nor is it that. This is ordinary, but say it's relaxed, not grasping, nor is it rejecting. Well, apply that to the mind. And you say, get out of here. Come here. I want this. I don't want that. Now, if you now just to say the relaxed position is to. Just 
observe that as a changing condition. Because if you start thinking, I shouldn't have desires to get rid of, I shouldn't have desires to grasp, you may complicate and get terribly complicated. I've got to do something about this grasping. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get rid of this grasping, and you just don't know what you're doing. <laughs> It's not a matter of getting rid of, or of uh, getting more of, but of observing. If, when I say it, it's an inner peace, a, re, a, a relaxation of the heart, maybe. It's like a sigh. <sighs> Just being at ease with things. But before it was, what should I do next? What should I do next? What? I've got so many faults, like, I'll never, never get enlightened in the next 10,000 lifetimes, I'm so bad. And I've got to, let's see, I've got to do this and do that, and then do this and then do that, and then everything's going crazy, isn't it? And then you, then you think, I can't, I know, I'll never be able to do it, so you go take some kind of sleeping pill, zonk. <laughs> But it, that's why there's this inner listening, this listen to it. The, have, have, develop that gentleness of metta. Like, when you go home, practice that. Try, try really developing that in, in your layman's life, in your work, with, your, with yourself mainly. If you can do it with yourself, you'll be able to do it for others. This, this gentleness, kindness, even, you know, no matter how awful, what a really wretched, miserable person you are, <laughs> have metta for it, because it's not really you, you see, you just think it is. Just have this kind of peacefulness with it. Peaceful coexistence. You think, well, I've got these terrible weaknesses and problems, and I should do something. You think I'm just going to have to spend the rest of my life just having metta for this miserable being, me? <laughs> Do you think it's permanent? Do you think you're permanently a miserable wretch? No, if you, you know, the miserable wretches come and go, just like everything else. They're not any, there's nothing permanent about them at all. So, if you have this metta, this gentleness, and patience, and uh, peacefulness with these conditions, you'll You'll be able to see miserable wretches are quite all right. They come, they go. You get, sometimes there's crossness, grumpiness, selfishness, pride, conceit, jealousy, envy, anger and hatred and greed, lust, the whole doubt and fear, the whole gamut of miserable conditions will come and go. But that's all right. You're not, you're not asking you to... to uh, to build a fence around yourself and refuse to let anything come and go. But to watch the comings and goings, that which comes and goes is not you, is not yours. Now, in a listening also, when you listen to the conditions of the mind, you begin to hear the, the mind itself, the silence of the mind. Then listen beyond the conditions that rise and pass away. Listen to the inner silence. Now, when you can hear that inner silence, then it, then conditions come and go in that silence. You can actually concentrate on inner silence. If you're trying to think about it, then that's another condition. But just this bare attention will allow to hear. Uh, a, a kind of sound or silence that is not something that, that doesn't arise or pass away. It's like space in this room here. We're attached to the thing. We don't space. We don't notice. Oh, look at the curtains. Look at the walls. Look at the shrine. Look at the monks. Look at the 
meditators. We can spend our time here just looking at the things in this room, thinking, how could we improve it, make it more beautiful, or whatever. Trying to create the perfect meditation hall. You can be fascinated, or look at the people, and think, wonder what he's like, wonder what she's like. Look at him, why is he smiling like that? Look at her, why is she frowning like that? Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> get com- completely caught up in the conditions of the room here. So that, but the most important thing that makes this room livable so that we can all fit in it is the space. If there wasn't any space in this room, we couldn't be here, could we? This was a solid room, solid with no space in it. It would not serve our purposes as a shrine room anymore. It would be a block. Now the space is contained with form, like the walls of this room contain the space. So you don't have to, you don't have infinite space, you have a contained space that kind of protects you. But the space is, is the most important thing in this room, as far as the room goes. The rest isn't all that necessary. But it's the thing we would least notice, because it doesn't have any particular characteristic. Not red space, blue space, not interesting space, it's not boring space, it's not important space or unimportant space. It's not female space or male space. It's just space. The space around you and the space around me is just a a space. You can't say there's a tomato space there and a venerable sujito space over there. Doesn't make sense, does it? Space is we can all fit into this space. There's room for us all. In the mind there's space, a silence or space, an emptiness that we never notice because we're so caught up with the uh, conditions. Look at the drapes, look at the carpet, look at him, look at her, look at this. And we go on, we keep becoming fascinated or averse to the qualities that come and go, red, yellow, blue, green, orange, pink, purple, jumping for joy, falling down in despair and weeping, jumping for joy, falling down in despair and weeping. <laughs> now when you take refuge in the space of your mind, then, then, there's, then the meditation is very easy. There's nothing you have to do, it just let everything dissolve into space, because everything that arises will pass away into that emptiness. And that's definite. There's nothing that will, anything that arises will not stay. It will arise and pass. Now when, then you have a perspective that you don't have when you're, you see, it's hard for you to understand this because you're still very much identified with the conditions of the mind itself, your habitual ways of your thinking, your attitudes, all are based on the idea of being, becoming, uh, of being this or being that. Mm. So that's why in this uh, vipassana practice you're you're not annihilating conditions, you're not saying that, we're not getting rid of conditions, but we're, we're looking at them in a different way, so we have a perspective on them. Like an artist looking at, uh, looking at the space, becoming more aware of, the, of a perspective rather than just absorbing into a condition that, and that's out of perspective, being obsessed with one condition and lose the perspective on it, thinking that it's the ultimate reality or the real. 
Now Buddhism, Buddha's teaching makes a very clear makes it very clear what is conventional reality and what is ultimate reality. It's probably the most clear presentation of any known religion of the present time. Because this is where religion gets um, seems to get lost, is not having any, not knowing what is convention and what is conventional reality and what is ultimate reality. So, so many people get trapped into the conventions, conventional realities, like the religion, uh, the form of religion itself, is thinking that that's the ultimate reality. Thinking that a belief in God is the ultimate reality. Thinking that doing all these rituals and rites and precepts and all that is ultimate reality. Regarding that is real in itself, rather than conven- just a convention. But ultimate reality doesn't have a form. You can't say it's this or that. But conventional reality is always formed. It has a beginning and an end. Whatever begins and ends is only conventional reality. We're not denying that it, we're not saying it doesn't exist. Like it's silly if I said, you just don't exist, you know. You're not really here at all. You're a delusion. Anything. That one's hard to take. I certainly feel like I exist. But we're not saying that, that these bodies are illusions and that they don't really exist. We're saying the perception of it. Our attachment to the perception of it makes us regard, see it as something other than what it really is. So it's the attachment to the perception rather than the perception itself or the uh, body or any condition. It's the attachment. Now this way of seeing the impermanent nature of condition is a way of letting go of uh, non-attachment. First we say letting go because our habitual our ways are always so to grasp everything. But as we are more aware, we begin to not grasp, and then we just don't, do not attach. We just let things come and go. We don't feel compelled to manipulate, control, repress, or annihilate, or <coughs> possess, because we know those, are, those themselves are just changing conditions conventional realities. So, the Buddhist monk lives in the world of conventional reality like, like you do. Ajahn Cha has to eat food, walk on arms round, go to sleep, sit down, walk, lie down, go to the toilet, just like any other human being. Conventional realities are that way. But the ultimate reality is he, Ajahn Chah no longer attaches to any of those things. No longer deluded by the conventional realities. There's no more doubts. He no longer sees himself as being this or that, or that he should become anything or should get rid of anything. So he's at ease. He's a, he's a human being, conventional, a man, Thai, man, a monk, Buddhist monk, 64 years old, conventional reality, but not attached. But he hasn't thrown it away either, he's not saying, he hasn't killed himself, he still can laugh and talk and, and, uh, and visit America and <laughs> It's not like he's kind of a ghost floating through space. He just looks as physical as anyone else. But there's no non-attachment to it. No no longer deluded by it. Now it's just that much. If you start thinking, uh, you know, 
of meditation as being anything special or that you have to do anything special might be wise to do something special but realize that that's only a that's only a, a thought and opinion don't grasp it as that uh, you know cling to the ideas of meditation as being special But listen to that thing in your mind that always opinionates, has views, fears, doubts, and worries, seeing the impermanent nature of that. Conform the bodily actions and speech, as I was saying last night, to the, to the form of the moral precepts, as a householder, as a layman to the five. That's very important. If you're to be um, uh, uh, have a, a good container, a good form, is necessary. See, too many people meditating without a form, and they just kind of drift around. They don't. They, you cannot, you, you really can't get anywhere that way. Really can't. You, you know, it's just not possible. You just flit about, fooling yourself. So, establish the the bodily action and speech in the form of five precepts, eight precepts, 227 rules of the monk, whatever. In the future, I know it's hard for, for many of you who don't have to live in conditions where People don't respect that, those kind of precepts, so you just have to do the best you can, really. But keep in keep in mind that the form is a guide for action and speech. Eventually, hopefully, communities will grow up around monasteries and that, where people will be able to join in community and. Uh, that's always nice. When it's very nice to live in Dharma communities where you have su- support each other, where your your interests in the Dhamma are shared, so that you don't have to always fight off the people who think, who get angry because you're you're being very moral. <laughs> Well, he's about the fighting people. <laughs> but you have to, as I was saying, you have to take into account your way, how you have to live and and work it out. Don't don't uh, don't be discouraged by what seem what seem, might seem impossible situation. Or. In, this, if you do, you know, if you feel that it's impossible, just note that. Just keep aware of that. Just keep, start from where you are right now. These are suggested ways of developing skillful life. Now this, uh, this, uh, as a human being, is a form, isn't it? You have to live. This isn't a form you voluntarily chose. It's a form you, you, you find yourself in as a man or a woman human being in this 20th century, 1981. This has a form, doesn't it? Looks like a monk, looks like a man, looks like a human being. Well, this contains, doesn't it? It's a container, just like any other form. So this body is a, is, is a form that we have to learn how to live within this form also of, of a human being. Now the human form means you have you're stuck to the ground. You can't fly up in the air. And you you have to suffer pain because the body's quite a painful condition and you have to Get hungry and cold, and and uh, 
just look at the society we live in how it's uh, people obsessed with convenience just these bodies are such a so heavy and so cumbersome that we have to spend uh, this technology develop this incredible technology just to make life more less painful for us anyway we think we're making it less painful by having all these uh, gadgets and make, trying to make life convenient because the body is a is a kind of clumsy condition and it gives us a lot of pain and it gets old, gets sick and dies when it's dark we can't see we have to have electricity and we can switch on the lights because in the dark it's rather frightening we don't know in in, uh, less advanced society like Northeast Thailand where they don't have electricity you learn to sit in the dark which is quite peaceful actually <laughs> when it gets dark you just sit in the dark and meditate peaceful and the dark is very peaceful so you say in a less technologically advanced society like in Northeast Thailand things are much more primitive. You have to draw water from wells, don't have electricity, uh, don't have electric uh, washing machines, dryers, dishwashers, all these things don't have. Ajahn Chah wouldn't even allow the pumps, electric pumps put on the wells. So the monks have to work together. We have the well rings at three in the afternoon, we have to go out to the well and help draw water in buckets, a uh, bucket on a, on a rope, pulley. It goes down into the well, we all pull it up, kind of big can like this. And monks get on, several monks on the rope and pull it up, and the other, another monk grabs the can and pours it into smaller buckets, and then you, just, then you put these buckets on a bamboo pole and two monks carry these buckets of water around to the different bathing places or the kitchen to fill up the water jugs <coughs> quite primitive isn't it but it all has its advantages too in the sense that you develop a, uh, you help each other in things like that there's not the sense of don't bother me I'm meditating it's a necessity of everybody has to help do the uh, do very simple chores like that. So that uh, this is a uh, seemingly inconvenience, but it's not really. It just makes life much. His life is really much easier because it's simpler when you have a lot of gadgets and convenient uh, a convenient technology life becomes more complex like find it like chitters if the plumbing then the sewers clog up the toilets and the, then they you have to have electric bills telephone you have to have uh, uh, rates and taxes and and uh, water, mains water, and goes on, endless kind of complexity just for some kind of what we think is convenient. But sometimes a less, uh, a, a more primitive or less technologically advanced way is, is a really more peaceful. At least I found it so easier but we have to take into account we live in a very technological age where technology is has gone rampant so don't dwell in discontent on that just live in a peaceful way with it we can certainly use electric washing machines dryers mains water and so 
electricity. But to see that it's not really necessary. If those things stop working, it's not the end of the world. You can just sit in the dark. It's very peaceful in the dark. You can. You don't need to have all kinds of fancy foods and luxuries and things like this to be happy because you find out if you train your mind, if you sit and are at ease with yourself, you're happy wherever you are. You can be in the middle of New York or in the middle of jungle. You can have everything or nothing and you can be content if your mind is is good then what there's no there's no sorrow anymore. The dark is fine, the light is fine. Because the mind itself is, is bliss, is peace, is light. You don't need to depend upon the conventional reality of the senses anymore. If, they, if you go blind, it's quite all right. It's not, going to, it's not the end of the world. Because the sensual world can easily be destroyed or harmed. The bodies can easily be damaged. You can go blind or deaf. Tongue can be cut out. You can have leprosy. You can have cancer. Internal diseases and all kinds of... Your legs can be cut off, the arms. All kinds of dreadful things can happen, but that's to the body only. The mind is, all, is not damaged, even if all that happens. The worst possible thing to happen, the mind would be all right. If you know that, if there's wisdom. So there's nothing to fear. People, just think what will happen if the technology failed. And I was living in London, I used to think, I don't want to be here in this city when it all starts falling apart because nobody will know what to do and everybody will start going crazy when the underground doesn't work anymore electric electricity and all the things stop functioning and there's no more food and really frightening millions of people all crammed in one area together that's really frightening to think of uh, you know you've become so dependent upon everything working the technology going on forever, you think it's, it's kind of permanently going to be there. But when I was in London, they had well, we, the first year they used to have electricity strikes, and you, suddenly the lights would go out, and the whole city would be dark. And they had a dustman strike, dustmen or garbage men. For how long was it? Um, couple of months nobody collected the garbage in London it's pretty bad actually <laughs> ah. Now this, we think we have to have this, uh, the, all these things for our happiness. But like in the, this morning, contemplation of the four requisites, we, you really don't need very much. If you, this note here, if you, when you're really at peace with yourself, when you're calm, it's, it's just nice to just sit. It's very nice just to be, just sitting or standing, walking, lying down. You don't need anything, you don't need books or television or anything. The mind itself is so nice, so good, and so uh, perfect that it don't, you don't, the rest seems rather, uh, very unnecessary. <clears throat> you can just eat to survive, just take care of the body. You don't have to spend your life eating food, munching, escaping through uh, habitual munching on things, smoking cigarettes, dope, drinking, going to show bars, looking around for something to do, 